I've been working in fashion since I was 15, and I've always found the inner workings of the industry fascinating. As an art form, it has the power to create social change and challenge ideas of body image and sexuality. The thing that really bothers me, though, is that people are very dismissive of fashion in general. It comes across in a cliched way. It's considered frivolous or indulgent. I feel like the general public don't take it seriously enough. <gasps> oh my god, I wonder if they have that in my size. I'm kidding! That was a joke! The point is, fashion should be allowed to be fun and all of those things, but it shouldn't be defined by those ideas because it's also so many other things. I found the industry to be full of very hard-working people who take their jobs very seriously, and that's what I want to celebrate. This series, then, is an attempt to address these negative stereotypes a mission to uncover the true depth of the industry and the huge variety of roles that go towards sending clothes down the catwalk season after season. With your guidance, I'll be talking to people from all disciplines and levels of the industry to find out what's in store for fashion's future. is a book of Polaroids that I would have collected when I was modelling and I was started when I was like 15 or 16 and then at the end of the shoot you'd take Polaroids you know it was pre-digital times you have to wait four minutes on the mark while they developed so this I shot for wallpaper magazine it was for an underwear story but I was always like weird about being photographed in my pants I was like why have the girls got to wear their underwear but all you you are fully clothed and the men were like okay we'll all get in our pants and very sweetly made the whole crew on the set that day get down to their underwear and do the shoot with me <laughs> eventually I got really bored of modeling and I actually ended up assisting and would make cups of tea for people and hold like a light meter and stuff and I loved that I think I always just felt uncomfortable modelling because I, I found it really hard to keep my mouth shut. Which actually worked in my favour because I started doing adverts and then I started doing television. And in the first meeting for Pop World, they asked me my opinion on music, obviously. And I could have cried with happiness because I think it was the first time since school that I'd been asked what I thought of something. Amazing then becoming more immersed in the fashion industry in a different way through interviewing designers or being invited to attend things. When I met people like Karl Lagerfeld or Valentino or, you know, really well-respected designers, I couldn't believe that they were human and that they were really kind and that they were personable. Then I shot my first Vogue cover, which, again, I never believed in a million years I'd be able to do. And everyone was so nice and normal and... Cool. They were like, should we get some cake and tea and stuff? And I was like, whoa, cool. Everyone's friendly. Wow. The British Fashion Council play a crucial role in nurturing the growth of the UK's industry, which makes it the perfect place to start this documentary. One of their key aims is to reinforce fashion's public image in a positive and progressive light. Journalist Sarah Moa is an ambassador for NewGen, one of their most vital projects. Each year, the NewGen committee selects a handful of emerging designers to support with grants, mentorship and business advice, ensuring the British industry is bolstered by a constant influx of ambitious new independent brands. Do you need money to become a fashion designer or somebody that works in the fashion industry? Because I feel like... Perhaps parents are discouraging their children from moving in the direction of fashion because it's perceived as an industry that might not be that supportive of a career. There is very little awareness in schools and amongst the parental generation that the fashion industry in this country is worth £28 billion. It's bigger even than the automotive industry. When somebody's looking at fashion from the outside, they think, especially when they're young, that perhaps fashion is just being a model, maybe a makeup artist, a hairdresser. But there's a whole array, a real spectrum of the skills needed, many, many, many roles. The reason that we have such an incredibly diverse and creative culture here is that university education needs to be free, so yeah. there are no barriers. Their talent is not uh, distributed by class or, or by wealth. income. Yeah. So what's really important is that the young and really talented people are not prevented from going to university because of the idea of debt. 
So at the British Fashion Council, we've set up a British Fashion Council Education Foundation and we're actively raising money for scholarships, hoping that we will be able to raise awareness amongst companies and philanthropists that yeah. this money is needed. All students face the same thing, but studying fashion is more expensive because you actually have to make a collection. What's your dream future for the fashion industry? I really hope that the generation of designers who have established themselves now yeah. in the last 10, 15 years will be there in another 20 years as great brands mm -hmm. and that they will be incredibly important employers of you know, the next two generations. Also, I want designers to have the freedom to think about very big issues about what they want, what they dream about and how they're going to reflect society because this is actually what's the essence of British spirit. I want to see that shine and turn into money, jobs and a great environment for ideas. One of New Gen's many success stories, Christopher Kane, is often referred to as the contemporary king of British fashion. He's the perfect example of a designer that has never compromised his artistry on the road to building his global fashion empire. This is new season, yeah? This is the amazing Lamy. This is beautiful. I love that show. I know, it was so good in the bodies Brilliant. as well. This looked amazing. Like, Stunning. Like, and this is all life drawing, so you can see the car. When did you do those? This was old art school stuff. It was drawings I had rolled up, and we just brought them out and we made a print. And I've always wanted to do like some sort of pornographic thing, but I didn't want it to be that grotesque way it was all about doing. And that's why the bodies became very embraced. It was mm -hmm. before or after something. They were just so in love. And I mean, God forbid there's a penis or a nipple in the world. I had a, I had a dick. <laughs> you did? And I was brilliant. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, a I mean, penis. It was a so penis. So you can make the film, you had a penis. And yeah. it was drawn by me, so that's, I mean, it's art. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've been visiting lots of people. Yeah. We basically did a Google search of what people were writing in about the fashion industry to find out, because often it's kind of a closed book, and unless you're well-versed on how to break into that industry, Absolutely, yeah. the misconception is it's all through privilege, or you have to go to a certain college to get a certain degree, or blah, 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 when there's loads of other jobs and there's loads of other ways to kind of That's for sure, yeah. crack into it. When your name came up, People are, are very interested to know what your actual job is. Okay. Like, what's your title? So I'm creative director. Yeah. I basically, well, I draw everything. Yeah. And it all comes from me. All the ideas start from me, the concepts, then get filtered down. And then, obviously, do my own research. But it's always good to have, and I have had from the very beginning, a very close team of people that I really trust and rely on. Yeah. Especially my sister, Tammy, who's my main collaborator. But it's all about having this depth of knowledge behind the scenes. Me and Tammy have all these amazing ideas, but how do we get there? And like, for instance, bags. I can draw bags, I can draw shoes, but I don't know how to make them. So you really <laughs> need that, you need that, no, I can sellotape really well and super glue, but like practically, in, you need those amazing key knowledge of people who are really hard to get, but when you find them, they're like gold dust. So can you tell us a few jobs that people might not be aware of that are actually integral to your business? So, I mean, behind me there's like five amazing pattern cutters, oh. there's, there's obviously the PR, there's, um, there's production, which is super important. These are the, the key ingredients to make a successful business yeah. run well oiled and make it function properly. So you don't have to go to the best colleges to be these famous designers. You can go to amazing colleges all around the world. You can become a seamstress, you can become a tailor, mm -hmm. and that adds to this bigger world which you see in the public eye. Do you think that you would have achieved so much without Tammy? Not at all, no. Tammy is creative director also. Yeah. And we share everything together. We, I mean, people want Tammy's in the world, but they'll never have a Tammy like my Tammy, so. <laughs> we started straight out of college in the bedroom in Dalston, mm -hmm. and we made so many, so many mistakes. Tammy was much more business-headed than me. And she's a designer. People don't think Tammy is a designer. She's a qualified designer who went to a great art school in Scotland, yeah. Gala Shields, where she learned knitwear, textiles. It was business-led as well, so she learned a full spectrum. Yeah. Whereas when I went to St Martin's, it was very independent-led. You'd really made it what you wanted. But do you think you still need an education in fashion in order to advance? I think education is so important. I think training and being hands-on and really getting your, your feet wet. I think when I obviously 
was studying at St Martin's for six years. I did so many internships. I worked the whole summer doing internships for Russell Sage or Giles Deacon, and it wasn't, and I wasn't getting paid, and that was how it was. But mm. I was getting paid with the immense knowledge I was seeing. I was meeting people at like Katie Grand, Russell Marsh, and Guido. These are people that you could only dream working with, and I was watching them work. Yeah. So. I'm sorry, but that was better than any cash in my hand. It was literally, I was seeing the inside out and it was phenomenal. Yeah. When I was at high school, uh -huh. people who were the guidance teachers were like, why do you want to do that? Fashion designer? Really? Artist? There's not a job, that's not a real job. I'm like, really? Welcome everybody here today. Thank you very, very much to all the students from St Martin's who participated today. The winner this year is Christopher Kane. Yeah! It's your life, you've only got one shot at it, so you need to know what you're good at and you try it out. If it doesn't work, then you do something else. It's not the end of the world, but it does take a certain person to do that, I understand, but you toughen up over the years. You need to, because there's, like you say, there's always some better looking, <laughs> better designer, skinnier, taller, so it's just good to be you sometimes too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was the one. <laughs> oh Okay, so we spoke to Google and asked them to give us a compendium of information on what people are most inquisitive about in fashion. The most Googled career questions. It's how do you become a fashion designer? How fashion bloggers make money? <laughs> how do fashion bloggers make money? Are fashion designers artists? Are fashion designers rich? No. Uh, how do you become a buyer? How do you get a career in fashion journalism? How to get a job at Vogue? Hey! It's not that random, it's quite specific. So maybe everyone that likes fashion is very serious and pragmatic, like me. When I was at school, I wanted to be a fashion journalist. And in Hampshire, <laughs> I went to the careers advisor. And when I was like 14 or however old you have to be, and I said, I'd like to be this, please. And they were like, oh, we don't know. It's interesting to, to discover that it hasn't changed much since I was floundering as a teenager, wanting to know how I could become a fashion journalist, that that still hasn't been answered, even though there's a huge database on the internet now that you have thought you could harness, but really it still remained this elusive, you know, thing that's perceived as haughty and untouchable. I'm surprised that that's still the case. These types of questions are probably most pertinent to the thousands of students graduating in fashion and textiles every year in the UK. Central St. Martin's School of Art is home to one of the most prestigious fashion courses in the world. Famous for nurturing extraordinary creative talent, alumni include Stella McCartney, John Galliano, and Alexander McQueen. But, you know, a couple of people. Each year, around 100 students graduate from their BA and MA courses, heading out into the big bad world to make their mark on the fashion industry of the future. Willie Walters is the fashion programme director. And so how long has it been that you could actually study fashion? Like, do you know when that emerged as something that you could actually go to um, school for? Well, that's really interesting because I know St. Martin's fashion started in 1939 with a woman called Muriel Pemberton. She saw a need for young people to sketch fashion, to go to the Paris shows, to disseminate fashion, and then to start creating and designing. The LCC wouldn't allow them to do that at first, so they had to hide their machines under the table so oh, the wow. inspectors came around. And gradually they started constructing garments. Did you study here? I did, yes, and that's exactly my path. When I was studying fashion, nobody you really thought about what you would do afterwards. Right. It was much more limited. Certainly during the 70s and the 80s, being perceived as a designer was not considered very serious. Right. I think things changed a lot in the 90s, but I can remember applying for um, a driving insurance mm -hmm. and calling up a company and they said, well, what's your, what's your occupation? I went, oh, I'm a fashion designer. But we don't teach your fashion designers. Oh, no. Why? You know, well, obviously, we were not sober citizens. Oh I, mean, they, I think they thought we'd be driving along with one hand with a <laughs> bottle of champagne, you know. <laughs> It's like yeah, the window. Fab, exactly, yeah. totally out fab. That's yeah. exactly what the, the conception was. Despite the course having more of a fine art approach, the students are under increasing pressure to leave the college with the skills demanded by the contemporary fashion industry. Having just got their results one week earlier, Willie's students are preparing to fly the nest. So, 
Have you just oh graduated? We are graduating. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Yeah. You get to wear the weird hat? Yeah. Mm. Oh we don't know what to wear underneath, though. None of us. What about a silver unitard? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my parents would think love that. It. Think about it. Think about it. Chris studies fashion communication, Evan women's wear, and Eleanor design and marketing. What was your perception of the fashion industry before you were ensconced in this world? I completely didn't understand how many jobs there are in the things that you don't see, which is actually most of the fashion industry. Okay. I like realised that a lot on my placement year, like how many people work in production, how many people work and their job is to make sure that like the buttons get flown from Italy for the right day. But no one ever really mentioned that side of things. People say everyone's going to be really mean, but actually I don't think that's true. When I was 18 I read The Devil Wears Prada just before the film came out. Yeah. And then I actually read it having worked in magazines for like four years. I couldn't finish it reading it because I was like, oh my God, why is she complaining so much? Like, right. what, what's wrong with her? I've had to do all of that kind of stuff. And I just <laughs> really? got on with it and not, not complained about it. And I have to say, that film, oh, I do kind of love it because it's cult, but that has a kind of a bit of a lot to answer for, I think. How do you feel about the government sort of removing funding from helping people do this type of course? I mean, it's not impossible, but it does make it so difficult. Yeah. Especially when you come from a, like a background where, you know, you don't necessarily have money behind you. It does make it very difficult. You have to buy everything. Yeah. You, like, yeah, so how much does yeah. a collection cost to produce at the end of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't even want to work it out. One of my, oh God, okay. one of my friends, and she does knitwear, and it was somewhere between four, four and a half thousand pounds, we oh. reckon. Are you nervous at all about life after this? I mean, it's really hard. I think the best way to work is going into one of these collectives where there's different people who, are, who actually are sort of specialised in certain areas. So you'll have someone who is amazing at knitwear, someone who's a really, really good pattern cutter, yeah. which is really, and then somebody who's maybe a bit more into the business, like the communication side of stuff. I mean, most labels, have you know someone who's the face of it they are and then there's this sort of right hand man or woman yeah definitely like Christopher Kane and his sister yeah like she does all of his kind of branding and stuff and I think that the importance of having a team around you and having a like having a, a collective team means that there's more people to bounce our ideas around yeah and then there's also more people to be able to put money into it together because you have autumn winter spring summer collection mm -hmm. but you also have resort and pre-fall and that means that you these smaller labels who don't have enough money to put presentations and shows together have to produce four labels every single year. And there's a kind of a move towards doing presentations. Like Molly of, Goddard. Yeah, like Molly Goddard, yeah, yeah. Presentations and being more interesting with your presentation because there's a lot less pressure. You don't have to have a lot more people involved in that respect. Yeah. And so there's less money involved. And you can kind of have people come and go. So, so, so why do they even bother having catwalk shows? Well, I mean, th that's the question. How important nowadays are catwalk shows? Because Really, really important for the ego, okay? Yeah, well, that's the thing, though. It's the elitist, I think. <laughs> just want to be front row. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> A recent student of CSM, Molly Goddard, is a new den designer who is one of the most notable proponents of the new approach to presentation, a tactic that just won her a coveted installation at London's Dover Street Market, a place I have recently banned myself from. How are you? Good, how are you? That's great. <laughs> Good nice to see nice you. To see you. This is very nice. It's a bit of a mess. Oh, so this is your autumn winter is, yeah. 15 so presentation at Somerset House. Okay. And it was in the most perfect space because it was really kind of grand but dilapidated. My mum, Sarah Edwards, did all the set design. So we just filled the walls with drawings and had easels that we borrowed from the RA, I think, mm -hmm. and paints everywhere. And, and then George turned up and took off his robe and sat in the middle and all the girls drew. And then we had another room off to the side where... There's a still life and all the girls did drawings and they just switched around and drew for two hours and everyone watched. Molly's first show was even more off the cuff. She simply threw a party in her town hall and got all her friends to wear the dresses. But the uniqueness of the display was enough to catch the attention of the fashion press. It was fun because there was no pressure. I didn't know that anyone would turn up. I just thought my friends might turn up. I never thought of buyers. I didn't really know that buyers existed like that. <laughs> they came and then you had like a meeting and then you did a showroom. I didn't really know that. So yeah, that was all a bit of a shock when people then wanted to buy it. And then we just had to produce it. And then as we started producing it, more and more people ordered. Because I think when Dover Street order, they, you know, people kind of take notice. Yeah. Of that. 
So obviously here you have a team of people that are actually physically making all your garments, but yeah. do you, is that hard to find in Britain at the moment? Like, are there not many people with that skill set? Yeah, I think it's very hard. Phoebe and Rosie, who are seen as uh, actually do did costume, and I think like you learn so much more doing something like costume than fashion. Really? So I'm really like, I didn't realise that until I kind of met Phoebe, but I think like just making is such a good job because it is creative like we always discuss like how, there's things I don't know about what I'm doing and Phoebe knows a better way to finish it so for the next time you have to show do you think you'll keep doing unique presentations or are you gonna have a, a catwalk show I think next time will be another similar thing like we're thinking of kind of like a vegetable show a vegetable show yeah what does that mean? <laughs> like a like a um, horticultural oh cool show. I think. Okay. <laughs>
Karen Franklin. So roughly, yeah. what area are we talking about? Well, basically, we're making a documentary about fashion. We've been talking. How much do I know? We've been talking to um, <laughs> lots of people. We interviewed um, Central St. Martin students yesterday about right. maybe some of their frustrations with getting into the industry once you've graduated from university. So we were interested in how you yeah. became immersed in that world. I was never interested in fashion. That's so true. That's... Got into it by accident. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> most people we've spoken to, that yeah. was what happened, which is interesting as well. It wasn't yeah. like, it didn't seem like a job option at the time or something. No, because it wasn't. Right. Because fashion back in the 80s wasn't really a respectable career. My dad would often say to me, when are you going to get a job that pays you proper money? <laughs> <laughs> So you were studying graphic design? Yeah, yeah. So did you think, oh, I'd quite like a job in that world? So I was at Kingston for three years with Helen Storey, John Richmond, Glenn Bailey. Mm -hmm. And so they needed people to wear their clothes. So I would always kind of stand there like that where everything's fitted on me and think, I, this is much more interesting than what I'm doing. Yeah. And so I spent my course photographing them and listening to what tutors were saying. And so I obviously kind of picked up stuff by osmosis. And I just thought, that's my family. That's Aww. where I belong. So that was the thing I wanted to do when I left. And yeah. so that was the first knock on the door. You know, in those days, it wasn't as competitive as it is now. There yeah. weren't so many people studying. It wasn't on telly. It wasn't until Clothes Show that people got excited about, oh, fashion. When we first started, people couldn't name English designers. They right. didn't know they had an, um, an amazing industry. That feeds into what we're talking about, because we were discussing how that influenced so many people like Christopher Kane and, and everyone we've been talking to, it, it talked about fashion and it gave it weight and it didn't make it seem frivolous or silly. Sometimes it did, but it was yeah. fun. It was a dream job. I mean, and it did shape me because it really did care about ordinary people's experience of fashion. British youth are famed for their colourful uniforms and tribal affiliations. For the gents, inspiration comes from all quarters and hip-hop culture has made a major impact on the fashion scene. But what's going to happen next? We've come down to Bristol to watch street style in action and find out who's wearing what. Well, my whole space that I've been working on for a long time is, you know, body image positivity and diversity. And back in the day, when I first started fashion, I thought nothing of seeing middle-aged women, pensioners on the catwalk, because that's what Body Map did, and they were the coolest design duo yeah. around. They had their mums, their aunties, they had their clubland friends yeah. on the catwalk. Do you think it's changing slightly now? I mean, I've seen with social media and the kind of rise of girls with personality once more kind of dominating yeah. that arena because obviously it's all about how many followers you have and the most captivating women tend to be those who are kind of showing more of themselves. People like Cara Delevingne or Kendall Jenner, they're on the catwalk, you know, live streaming it and mm. being a bit more yeah. interesting. Yeah. So I hope that it's moving in that direction. But it's tough, like I get, whenever I have to read anything, it's always like about how scrawny I look or how gross mm, I am. Mm. And then I'm asked to talk, comment on that in interviews or whatever, and it's really difficult to know what to say because I want to be able to promote a healthy body image, but yeah. how can you, I don't know, in the last interview I gave, I was just saying, I would love to look like Daisy Lowe, but I don't. But I'm happy yeah. with how I look. But equally, I don't want to use this as an example of how yeah. young girls should look. That's so horrible. what are you going to say? I don't know. That's horrible. Advice, well, to a certain extent, if we had more of a spectrum of beauty, yeah. you would be able to hold your position and celebrate you, who you are, as you rightly should be able mm -hmm. to. But, you know, we would be able to see all these mixes playing out. Yeah. So different body shapes, different ages, different ethnicities. You you know, different body types. Do you think that now is a good time for a revolution in fashion? It's always a good time for a revolution. Um, but uh, what I love is that people can do their thing in a kind of post-punk countercultural mm -hmm. way, but they now have, you know, they now can self-publish or they can set up immediate kind of e-commerce mm -hmm. and they can reach that community. So now has never been a better time for creatives to uh, shift, you know, to promote product and to promote themselves and what they stand for. Yeah. 
and we've never had this much sort of technology before. We've never had this much digital connection. And the very fact that, that people are powerful and they can create a narrative around something that is suddenly very meaningful mm -hmm. to the brands. You know, just maybe that is a massive power in itself. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> his classic brand relevant for over 45 years, Paul Smith has succeeded where many others have failed. <laughs> so people in fashion are really sane. At Business HQ in Covent Garden, a young and talented team work under the ever-enthusiastic guidance of the man himself, driving the brand forward into a bright future. What is this room then? This is spring, spring next year, uh, men's clothes and accessories. I love this. Yeah, good. I love that. And all that. So nice. That's my jam, that's my jam. Peace. This is my suit to travelling. Bravo. Look at that. Oh, it makes me want to be a boy. Checker bags on the way out. No, they're from my garden. Are they? Yeah. I wanted to be a racing cyclist. Right. You know, and uh, it never happened uh, because I had a bad crash. And then I ended up uh, meeting people from the art school in Nottingham. And then I worked as a shop assistant. And then I met a lady who became my girlfriend and now my wife. And she trained at the Royal College of Art uh -huh. uh, in couture fashion. Right. Uh, and so that was fantastic. So all my teaching was uh, at home on the kitchen table. Yeah. You know, uh, how to cut a pattern, how to you know put a sleeve in and the importance of cut and shape and at 21 I saw Saint Laurent the first the first smoking suit wow. when they walked on and they went like that and there was little boobies underneath and it was like <laughs> <gasps> because it was very you know Provocative. shocking at yeah. the time uh, we started a little collection I mean literally, literally two jackets four shirts mm -hmm. for men to start with and then about 20 years ago for women People refer to Paul Smith as brand, and I was, it's a bit weird for me. Yeah, because yeah, I think, yeah. well, yeah, am I a brand? Yeah, yeah, he's written in my underpants, but I mean, <laughs> well, I'm a watch, actually. Do young people approach you and ask your advice? All the time, so yeah. What, what's, what do they want to know? When I walk around the building with like, the students, you know, I said, first of all, you all might want to be designers, but in a way, get that out of your head, right. because as you walk around the building, I'm going to show you lots of lovely jobs you can do yeah. with that skill. There's buying, there's press, there's uh, social media, mm -hmm. there's shop design, there's styling, there's management. There's so many great jobs you can get if you go through that fashion system. You yeah, know. and they're still creative, you're still like... Very creative, yeah. yeah, very creative. Part of your success has been down to the fact that you've always embraced the new and you've, yep. you've moved along with the times, but is that something that just comes naturally to you as a person? I You're think just excited you, about... Yeah, I'm a very curious person, whereas a lot of people, I think, they, they start, they leave university or college and then they have this look and then it goes on and on. And unfortunately, a lot of them don't really change from it and then that's when it starts to get difficult because right. you know fashion is about today and tomorrow you've never made it basically I've always liked the idea of being a buyer getting paid to shop with someone else's credit card sounds like a pretty amazing job to me our Google results suggested it is now one of the most desirable positions within fashion but what is it that these mysterious people actually do? At Selfridges Oxford Street Store, Judd Crane is living the dream as director of women's wear and accessories. I'm obsessed with clothes, it's a problem. You can suggest things for me to buy and I'll tell you I can't afford them. Is this in the sale, be honest? No, it's brand new. Uh, I just love everything, I just love it. So it's a bit of a mystery to me what your job is. Can you explain what you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it, at a very basic level, we just see things we love and we buy them so that other people can buy them. And then how do you decide which brands go next to the other one? Do they have rules where some brands might not want to sit alongside another competitor? 
Well, everyone has ideas of where they want to be, right. but ultimately what we're interested in is creating an environment for the customer. Yeah. So a lot of times we challenge our brands to really think differently about how they could be portrayed. We're a store that has Chanel just directly across from Rick Owens, mm -hmm. which you don't really see in, in many environments. Yeah. But for us, the idea of, of putting those two together is that we actually find it stimulates both of those customers. I actually think the best way to gain experience to be a good buyer is to not become a buyer directly. You know, I think to have a background in visual merchandising mm -hmm. or, or a background um, actually working with customers. We, we have a few buyers that have come from personal shopping oh, because, right. because they actually get really, really close to what customers want. It's literally my dream job, I think. But actually, my taste in things isn't reflective of what sells. <laughs> That's a really interesting thing about it, is it's really interesting to try to force yourself to be objective. Yeah. Because it kind of has nothing to do with what you want to wear, what, no. in terms of what, what might sell. However, I think it's so important to have that thing that just hits you emotionally. Yeah. Because it will hit other people too. You're touching on what we're talking about in a broader sense, which is that fashion has a reputation for being like shallow and all about image and da da da. But actually, when you get to it, the reason people are interested in it and the reason people have jobs uh, within this industry is because it is emotional for everyone, it's about identity, it's about how you feel, it's about creating a persona. And I think it's really an art form for some people and you're kind of like expressing things that, that are intrinsically personal mm -hmm. by, by what you wear. These are people's lives hanging up here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. When innovative thinking and technology combine, new industries are born that change the face of fashion forever. And in the late 90s, trend forecasting did exactly that. Global powerhouse WGSN pioneered the market, turning the potential trends of the future into a highly valuable commodity. Hello, everyone's looking at asses. <laughs> Essentially what we're doing is trend forecasting. So we are going around the world looking at all sorts of cultural influences from street fashion to what's going on in food, cars, whatever it may be, collecting all of that um, information, presenting it to our customers and using that to kind of set a backdrop for how fashion will develop in the future because all of those things influence the way people want to dress. So essentially it's a website yeah. and we have you know, several thousand brands around the world that subscribe to our website and they all use it in many and varied ways and they're looking at um, fashion trends. So we, desi we are designing fashion collections and yeah. they're looking at that. They're looking at catwalks, they're looking at street fashion, they're looking at retail trends. We go around the world and look at what's going on in shops mm -hmm. and explain that to people. So really enormous resource for fashion. If I'm thinking about what's about to happen or how mm. I'd like to get dressed, mm. anything that makes me feel a bit sick or a bit weird is something that I'm drawn to. And then that's usually because it's yeah. different to what I'm yeah. accustomed to. Yeah. Often with a Christopher Kane collection, I don't know mm. why him mm. in particular, but it'll come down and I'll be like, I mean, I can appreciate that it's great, but right. I don't necessarily want to wear it yet. And yeah. then suddenly when that season rolls around, yeah. I think it's so perfect for it, it, how I feel it, at the time. It's clever like that. I, sometimes I look at some of the things that we do and just think, are we sure about this? Yeah. But you trust them because actually at the time that it's ready to drop, you're ready for it, you know, and you think, oh, I know, I'm, I, they're right. Suddenly I feel like wearing that, you know, it's interesting. And this is men's trends. This is men's trends. For, for when? Spring, summer 17. Oh my god, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so where do you collect ideas from? Everywhere, really. It's not just like one specific area we go to. We look across the boards. It's not just fashion. It's like what influences fashion as well. It's like music or subcultures or yeah. it girls, it guys films, like you said earlier. The biggest influence on this is partly to do with Cuba, the fact that it's open. Oh, to, right, to yeah, Americans. of course, yeah. And obviously there's a huge influx of tourism to, to Cuba. So then when you see that type of influence on, or in shops and in, you know, the world as you go out, are you, do you feel proud? Yeah, 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 of course. Oh, cool, Cuba. <laughs> This is Sam, who is the denim dude. Hi, how are you doing, dude? Nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah. So oh this is God, the denim you're desk. Your mouse is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All my sort of denim memorabilia. Nice. Yeah. Um, so you're responsible for compiling this entire. Yeah, everything thing. from like retail I do through to like catwalks. What we're doing right now, which is like the men's SS16 ones. Uh -huh. um, we do trade shows, um, street style. So obviously, yeah, designing stuff. They're looking around on other parts of like the internet as well. But we're doing that 
like specifically for each category so I'm looking at everything denim across like yeah. Instagram like Pinterest tumblers and I'm always looking for like new brands so like Bliss and Mischief I'd put them like on the blog as well which is like right. a public site so it's not um, just like you don't have to have a subscription to that and then I do like an interview with the brand as well oh, to try and nice. give them like some exposure so very good okay like, brands, as long yeah. as they're looking up they're yeah <laughs> But there's no way at school I would have known that this was a job option. It's so fun. Do you take interns? Fashion used to be really top down. It used yeah. to be whatever somebody in Paris said it was, that mm. was what it was, you know. And now, you know, it is kids on the street. Is that from social media as well? It is. It is. And, and they are much more influenced peer to peer than they would be from what any couture designer would tell them. You know, it's yeah. more important what their mates think. It's harder to be that underground because there's always somebody, you know, communicating that and tweeting it and Instagramming it, whatever it is. Yeah. It gets out there much quicker, so the influence spreads much quicker. But then quickly. does that lend itself to the fashion industry kind of moving into a more do-it-yourself, yeah, like a DIY situation, yeah. rather than it being this elitist thing? It is, do you think it's an opportunity for people to kind of do a I, homegrown thing? I think that's absolutely right. And we were just talking about that. It's almost DIY life right now, you know. Um, if people much younger than me you know when I was growing up you had to get your degree and, and people were just sort of shoving you in a direction where you had to kind of go to a big organization and get a proper job mm. and then people were telling you how to dress it doesn't work like that now you know people don't feel the same constraints they will decide to create their own careers and that mm. might be online they might be bloggers they might have their own little shop online they might create their own fashion create their own music and they've got means of communicating that to other people that were just not open to us and you're seeing all these new and interesting designers coming up. It's a real change of that, guard, yeah. I think, at the moment. And I think perhaps maybe we'll be looking back and thinking that was when that started. Dior and I documented Raf Simmons' first couture collection as artistic director of the legendary Fashion House. It was widely celebrated for its honest portrayal of what really goes on behind the seams of made-to-measure fashion. Frederick Cheng was its director, and fun fact, he is three-eighths Chinese, just like me. What do you know about how fashion's been represented in film? Well, I pay a lot of attention because um, I've been thrown into this genre of fashion documentary, yeah. which hardly existed when I started making films because uh, the first one that I worked on, Valentino, The Last Emperor, well, I remember that when we tried to distribute the movie, people didn't understand. They were like, people are not interested in fashion. Why should we bring this movie to the theaters? And then the movie ended up being very successful in the US and you know that sort of started a genre. I don't think anyone has ever been in a better place at a better time than when I was editor of Vogue. It was the 60s, and it all started in London. The Beatles opened up an enormous new channel of excitement in life. You didn't have to have certain kinds of manners. You wore your mini skirt up to your crotch. In England, you wore what you want. What Diana Freeland did was she channeled a certain kind of energy. When we started releasing the films, we found out that a lot of people had misconceptions about fashion mm. and a lot of people had stereotypes about fashion, that it was superficial, which is completely the opposite of what we're trying to do. But that's what was so beautiful, I thought, about Dior and I, is that it's really the story of the people in the atelier and even Raph himself. To see him being vulnerable as well is something that is rare to get access to. If there is an image of Raph Simmons, like he's the one that I perceived when I started doing research on him, it's of someone who's very private, who's very guarded, mm -hmm. and who's very focused on the work. That's kind of what appealed to me, um, because I was trying to talk about fashion as art, talk about fashion in a serious way. There is no data that I'm not looking at art. I can't really explain it because it's so in my system. It's something that relaxes me and inspires me. And at the same time, it is also, I think, natural for me to connect it with what I do. I mean, I was interested in talking about the future of fashion and he seemed like the perfect vehicle to do that. And what did you observe when you're thinking of that, the future of fashion? Well, hopefully I see it headed in a more understated way where um, it's not all about the image, 
but there's a little more emphasis or at least recognition of the human side of fashion and mm -hmm. um, or the reality of fashion, which is that it's not just one man creating a collection. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a bunch of very talented uh, workers who are not just workers, they're really just hearts and minds, you know? I wanted to show that they have a part in the creative process. Yeah. So that they, they create, you know? Somebody, somebody in the atelier told me, like, if you give the, a sketch to 40 different seamstresses, you'll have 40 different dresses. Do you know this quote by Andy Warhol that says, uh, I'm deeply superficial? Fashion is a little bit like that, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, um, it is superficial because it's literally on the surface. <laughs> You see it, yeah. but if you look a little deeper, and that's what Diana Vreeland did very well, uh, what we try to convey with the documentary about her, mm. you can see things about the inside of society and how people perceive themselves. We need to start the show around 3 o'clock. see the psychology of the times. You can see the approach of a revolution in fashion, and that's absolutely true. If, if you know, in the 60s, women started uh, wearing miniskirts and mm -hmm. started um, dressing differently, and that was something that anticipated, you know, all the, the social turmoil that happened a little later. I think fashion is not disconnected from society and it's not just a uh, surface. If you read it well, you can see a lot in fashion. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> With the growing influx of hundreds of new designers competing for attention each year, it's increasingly difficult for new talent to get noticed. Jacques Mousse took matters into his own hands with a pretty novel approach to self-promotion. We've been talking a lot about this new crop of designers and not necessarily following the kind of same runway presentation things. Can you tell us about the strike that you had? Yeah, in I started by strikes and by happening in front of Dior show or in Vogue Fashion Night. I had no money to do a show, so I was straight off Dior, like with my girls, with all my friends. And so you dressed the models and brought them to the Dior yeah. show and then just stood outside? Yeah, that's it. And then what, what were people saying as they walked past? Like they were super surprised like to see to see us like this and it was like hey look at my work now like I'm Jacques Mus, I'm doing this, this, this. Yeah. So they were like, oh who is this little guy? <laughs> so intense. La mode, 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 la mode. And then how did that moment change? Like how did it First, turn into a little The French business? press was amazing. Like okay. there is no magazine like from glamour to self-service who didn't do like any special about me. So the French yeah. press helped me a lot. And Tumblr helped me a lot, I have to say, like like real girls. So you think that we, social media is like yeah. plays a huge part now? Yeah. For me, yeah. So obviously you've been successful and it and it worked. But what are your, some of your frustrations with the fashion industry that meant that you had to protest in front of their things, that you had to leave school early and do it? There, in Paris especially, there is no so many help for young talent. Right. That's a bit sad for me because I'm come from nowhere and mm -hmm. I would love that there is more people come from nowhere who are doing fashion in yeah. Paris. Because when I when I go in party, when I meet like people in magazine, I have the impression that everyone is friend with I mean, it's a real, like, I don't know. Click. Click. Yeah. Click world, and I'm not into that. Is being funny important in fashion? Is having a sense of humor? Uh, uh, for me, it was the most important thing in life, so in my fashion too, it's to, uh, to give the smile and to have the smile. Of course, fashion is, is serious, it's my job, but come on, it's close. We're not, uh, <laughs> in, yeah, it's, it's true, like, at least we're not, doctor or whatever anyway i want to keep this in when we come in my show i want people like relax i try to have like this kind of yeah kids uh, attitude like hey it's important for an iconic representation of french feminine style you can't do better than chloe the brand that invented ready-to-wear in the 1950s has been predominantly driven by women 
Today it is held by British designer Claire Waite Keller and she is lovely. So here's my office that I spend a lot of time in and as you can see it's a heap of books. And then I keep this board which is all my covers full of magazines and various different stuff and I pin things up. These are pinnable ones. Yeah, cork boards and oh. just throw up all kind of things I'm interested in or stuff that I love or nice. where I live most of the time. It's really it's nice. Oh here and I got something for you. Look. What have you got for me? <gasps> A present. Thank you so much. You get a little present for like See, this is what fashion yeah. does. <laughs> it makes you really happy. Thank you. Ah, so Bratula. So we've been talking to lots of people about the different jobs and different careers that there are that people might not know about. But it might be helpful if you just talk us through like what you do on a daily basis, because I'm sure it encompasses more than people imagine. Yeah, uh, it's one. It's one thing when you're actually outside the industry because you think it's just a lot of kind of oh, fabulous draping, and it turns into a dress in like one day. Um, but the reality is, it's it's a lot of really detailed work that mm -hmm. goes into kind of actually putting the whole collection together as a, an entire sort of story and, and statement. And so from the beginning of even doing storyboards and kind of getting fabric and colour yeah. together, so then actually really making that into a reality of sketches and does that actually look good? Get, does, does the fabric work? Does it drape well? Does it give you the right effect? And sometimes I can spend weeks just doing that stage of it just back and forth different fabrics mm -hmm. really trying to understand kind of what's going to work and then making the judgment between actually what will be good for the statement of the collection like yes yeah. what's really the content what's the whole story there was a quote where you said that for you fashion is very emotional and it has mm. to be kind of you have to have a connection to the clothes but do you ever find that when you're designing for Chloe which is obviously hugely commercially successful that you have to compromise in something that you might want and something that you know will be better for uh, for sales and things never for the show mm -hmm. but on pre-collections yeah you have to look at things in a different way because mostly it's it's going to be sold in the stores directly it's right. less about doing a runway um, and it's about the genuine the, the real customers who are going to buy it so you approach it slightly differently but at the same time ultimately okay being a woman you're going to be a bit more personal about things just mm -hmm. because you know how it fits you know how you like it to feel um, and it's more emotional experience as a woman we uh, interviewed karen franklin the oracle she felt with the lack of more women in those kind of CEO positions or at the mm. top of the chain, that that was having a trickle down effect on what was being created in terms of media imagery and the effect that that then had in a negative way on, on self-confidence and body image and things like that. Do you think that there's a correlation between those things? Uh, yes, for sure there is. Um, there's something about men at the top that does change the way women's fashion is run for mm -hmm. sure and actually my entire career I've basically answered to men um, and so it's but no more no more <laughs> now I can finally tell them um, but now it's really about uh, it's there are so few women CEOs though so yeah. in a way it's you know it's still a barrier to get through and so for me I find that that's the the most important thing is to kind of push the fact that actually being a woman you understand a lot more emotionally mm -hmm. the reason why some think should be or not in women's fashion mm -hmm. um, and I'm absolutely a huge advocate of it I don't want to use girls that are too skinny or too young we don't use anyone under 18 um, and I think this is something that really important to promote women in a healthy way <laughs> Steeped in rich history, Balmain has always reinvented itself, morphing between various incarnations of luxury. Over the past few years, however, the house has rocketed to new heights, thanks to creative director Olivier Roustang, who took the position at just 25 years of age. Hi. Do you want to show me things? Yeah. With Olivier came an opulent vision of luxury, worn by some of the most influential women of our time and seen by millions thanks to the power of social media. Love that, I love that. Welcome to the Bauman girl in a Bauman world. <laughs> I mean, it's the first time I see my dress without a heel. That's nice on you. It's 
kids up? Yeah. Also, I've got a secret kids. So. Yeah, nice push up, right? Can we do a zoom on this? Uh... <laughs> Shame me. I think the first thing that is important that I understood from fashion is that it can become your job. Mm -hmm. And that's something that when I was a kid, I didn't know. Because yeah. you know, it's the kind of thing that you're sketching, you love clothes, you love uh, talking with your friend and about the, the last Vogue and stuff. It's mm -hmm. something that you're like, oh, that's that's cool, that's that's a passion, but you don't think it can become a job. Yeah. And I think I realized that after my law school, because I did a law school. My you parents, did? Yeah. How did you realize that through studying law, though? Because I think, you know, I realized that I was, I was not happy. Right. And you know, when you realize what makes you happy, it's the kind of thing that you're like, okay, I'm going to push myself to actually make sure that I can become a fashion designer. Yeah. And fashion is something that, you know, when you're, when you're adopted, for example, I'm adopted. So, yeah. I mean, the thing is that I didn't know my parents. So I always love clothes to actually identify myself of course, something. yeah. You know, I was kind of playing a character. And I think fashion helps you in this way. Like, my parents, they stopped to give me money when I came to Italy. And mm -hmm. honestly, to be true to myself, I was dancing in a club to actually pay my rent. So yeah. they were like, uh, okay, you are shopping too much. Uh, we don't give you any more money. I was like, I need to have my Versace bag. <laughs> no. And I was 18 and uh, 19. So literally, now I I've think... Now I've got an image of you in yeah. knickers with a Versace bum bag <laughs> and like purple heels. No, the big one with the Medusa, come on. How much did you get at the club? The $150. Dollars. $150? $150. Dollars. Yeah. Did you get tips? Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. Let's be clear. I was dressed. <laughs> I love clothes. You know me. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't do something. The irony of having to wear nothing <laughs> in no. order to get something. You know, I was this big it's afro. Did I was you? Like, yeah, I was like this little. Uh, Le twins. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but cool. um, honestly, if you believe in you and you work hard, you it's not the money that helps. Because mm -hmm. you can have a lot of money and not getting the success and sometimes I also think that it's help to start from scratch mm -hmm. because you push yourself way more yeah um, did you ever think about setting up your own brand did you think maybe I just do a DIY approach and just start something now no actually you know I always wanted to work for a brand mm -hmm. because you know um, I love the archives I love the DNA of the house and I love to translate it mm -hmm. but I have to tell you also that when I started Barman, I was the Barman baby. I think now Barman is my baby. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's the thing, is that <laughs> when, you, when I started, I, I learned a lot from Barman, and now I feel like I give what I am to Barman. Today, if I have to do Olivier Roustin line, it would be exactly what I'm doing for Barman, yeah. because today the, the brand is, is me. Obviously, the landscape in fashion is changing, and you've been a huge pioneer in making it more modern, and even taking an old house and, yeah. see, and making it become relevant. How did you manage to do that and, and what are your steps for the future? Like, where do you see it all going? You know, I think fashion is changing in so many ways. Obviously, the social media is one of the most important things that mm -hmm. I think today is like the revolution of fashion because people is asking what's going to happen to magazines, what's going to happen also to the business because literally Instagram now is like a new way to, communi to communicate and to advertise your own brand. Mm -hmm. So literally, I think two years ago, everybody was kind of scared. You know, they were like, oh my God, is it luxury to go on social media? And now I feel like everybody wants to get uh, on social media, everybody yeah. from big group to different houses. And I think that's interesting. When you start to love social media, it's also because you want that your brand is known in also quantity of people, which mm -hmm. means that you want to get into a pop culture. And I think that's also a generous way to actually speak about fashion, yeah. and introduce people to fashion. Would you say that the way you engage with Instagram from your personal account is kind of typical of someone in fashion? No, I don't. I think, you know, I think what is funny with my Instagram is that um, I use in a really personal way, yeah. but at the same time, I'm kind of uh, known. So literally, it's kind of weird because you, you can see my uh, promoting my show and the day after promoting my cheeseburger or my chicken McNuggets. But the reality is that is what I say. It's, this is my reality. Welcome to my reality. And, and I really want to share with people the different sides of me. This is also my life. Oh, God, that's too... But, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see his cover? Which you make a point that when we talked about it before that it's like kind of shocking to see a man naked, but why? Why? Because there's so many women. You know what was the most shocking thing of this cover is that they managed to airbrush out your massive dick. 
I did discover, and I was just so scared of what people's gonna say. But the worst, I, I didn't even think about my parents. Yeah, Inst I mean, Instagram is is also that. Very cute. It's all me, whatever. It's all me. I think another amazing thing that you've done as well, you've chosen models that are really diverse and also have a really healthy uh, body image, yeah. such as Kim Kardashian yeah. or Rihanna. I mean, that's really great. I think it's important to, I think in my catwalk, on my catwalk, on my runway, I think it's important to show different faces of women. I love strong women. Um, but I think women, we don't need to hide their personality, we don't need to hide their body. That's my, that's my thing. I think it's important that fashion can show different kind of bodies. Mm -hmm. We have to show that fashion is open-minded. With my fashion at least, I'm trying to push so much the boundaries of the ethnicity, mm -hmm. because I feel like there is not enough black and Asian people in the fashion world. Mm -hmm. Because I also remember when I was a kid that I was dreaming about fashion. Yeah. I, it was just a dream also because I have no one to identify myself. Yeah. You know? I want to, sh more, to show to people that you can come from an orphanage. age. Doesn't, doesn't matter your background, doesn't yeah. matter your color. If you believe in yourself, you can work in fashion. Do you think that in, say, a decade's time or 50 years' time, people will look back at this moment and see it as a pivotal moment in fashion? I think um, we don't realize today but I think, yes, in, in one decade, we will remember this, this story of fashion. We remember the minima from the 2000s. We will remember like the high-tech revolution of 2010. Mm -hmm. I think we remember the Rihanna campaign, Yeah. which can be mine, we can be the Dior one. Mm -hmm. I think we can remember the first cover of Kanye and Kim on the, the Vogue US. Right, yeah. We remember also this Kim effect in fashion. I think that com that's going to be something really important. You know, like Kim in all the front rows and like being so strong in fashion and like uh, dressing from uh, Alaya to Givenchy to Balmain. I think we will remember also um, the Kate Middleton wedding in Alexander <laughs> McQueen. No, but you know what I mean? Actually, actually, you know, it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it is. Because when you think of what, all, what, what, all what happened during those last five years, yeah. why? I mean, there's so many things to remember. It's a fashion revolution. Wow. Coupé. We're going to go and see my agent, Saif. He is the uh, director of Next Paris, who are a modeling agency. And they're a very traditional modeling agency, and they have some of the biggest supermodels in the world. But also, they opened up a talent division, loose term, um, a few years ago, and they were one of the first agencies to kind of spot that trend for brands to use more personalities as opposed to just straight up models. So they were really ahead of the curve in understanding the like viability of social media and uh, the desire for a different style of woman, I think. He can't talk in normal pounds, so I asked him how much a jacket was, and he tried to tell me its price, but it came out like this. Uh, it is uh, 8 million, attends, uh, 800, uh, Alexa, it's uh, 800, 80 euro. Okay, 80 euro, 80 euro, 80 euro. Just looking at myself, it's like embarrassing. Oh, a bit awkward, all the way at the top. <laughs> I think it's in order of favourites. So, sure, ASAP Rocky, then FF, and then me, in at number three. First the worst, second the best, third one with a hairy chest. <laughs> More models. If you're a proper model, you get a bigger card. It's mainly so people can come in and do this. And you can test out a new head before you go to surgery. I'm a model agent and a talent agent. What I do at the end of the day, it's not about building an image or something that doesn't exist. It's just putting them at the right place. So you're the middleman? Yeah. And the boss? Uh, yeah, as well. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find it working in that environment? Like, what did you observe when you first started? How fast it was and how much it wasn't only about fun and images, but about uh, a real business. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time when I started, it was like 92. Uh, so it was kind of 
the end of this crazy moment where there were tons of money, when people just do jobs without any contracts. It was just like, okay, yeah, let's do it. We send you the girl, you do the campaign. Mm. Things changed. Model became all like uh, print shows. And everything was like the same. And uh, then internet, then digital. Okay, and then when did you start opening up like a talent division and what does talent encompass? Basically, at one point, I felt like I needed to um, feed them with um, uh, different people, not only about beauty. I think at the beginning, everyone wanted to sign actresses because it was something new. Uh, Anna Wintour decided to stop putting like models on the cover of American Vogue mm -hmm. and it was only actresses. So that was like starting from the top and everyone wanted to have a, a, an actress. The fashion industry feed itself with everything. And then on the other side, what it brings to other industries is very powerful. Mm. If uh, Lana Del Rey uh, is on cover of Rolling Stone about her new album, it's great. And it's great in terms of credibility. Uh, but if Lana is on the cover of Vogue uh, for her new album, the impact commercially, she have a million, ten <laughs> times more oof, visibility. I was telling them earlier about how you can't say single numbers. Oh, yeah. Mm. That's not nice. And trust me, in my life, I can have to. Mm, can I buy that for um, 100,000, 10 euros, please? <laughs> Initially, my idea that I approached Vogue with was to get designers or creatives, photographers, models, whoever it is that make up the tapestry of the fashion industry and have questions from me and then questions from young people that have an interest in fashion but didn't know how to get into it. And mainly I wanted to do that to show that fashion has a way more scope and a larger breadth than I think people give it credit for. I think we found like-minded people that had broken into the fashion industry in unorthodox ways. I hope that this shows that actually everyone's quite approachable and open-minded and um, keen to involve other people in this industry and that actually it would really benefit from a fresh injection of new perspectives. To enjoy fashion, you don't have to be sitting front row and feeling like you're important that season. Because it that actually doesn't mean anything and I enjoy clothes because I enjoy how they make me feel and how the, the power I think they have to transform your character into something that you can be whatever you want to be with clothes. It's more, it affects everyday people more than you would think. But the thing that I found interesting is actually, rather than uncovering issues, it's been more about scratching beneath the veneer that is presented and figuring out that actually fashion does have heart and soul and depth and emotion. So we need to bring it back to that. <laughs>